Hello and welcome to How Performance Assessments Support Deeper Learning and Equity. My name is Finn and I'll be in the background answering any WebEx technical questions. If you experience technical difficulties during this WebEx session, please dial 1-866-779-3239. Please note that as an attendee, you are part of a larger audience. However, due to privacy rights, we have chosen not to display the number or list of attendees to everyone on the call today. As a reminder, today's call is being recorded. We will be holding a Q&A at the conclusion of today's presentation. If you would like to ask a question, you can, may do so at any time using the chat box located on the right-hand side of your screen. Please type your question into the text field and click Send. Please keep the Send To defaulted to all participants so that the panelists may see the questions. With that, we invite you to sit back, relax, and enjoy today's presentation. I would now like to introduce your first speaker for today, Ronita Guha, Senior Researcher, Learning Policy Institute. Ronita, you now have the floor. Good afternoon. I'd like to welcome you to this one-hour webinar hosted by the Learning Policy Institute. Um, I want to let you know that the uh, webinar is open to the public and is being recorded. The recording will be mailed to you in a few days and available at the link just shared in the chat. We'd also like to announce that we'll be holding our next webinar, Leading the Way, How States Are Using Deeper Learning Assessments. That webinar will be held on May 17th at 11 a.m. Pacific. You can register and find more information about that webinar and the webinar series by visiting the Learning Policy Institute's website or using the links pasted in the chat box. Today, we'll begin with a presentation by Ann Cook, Executive Director and Co-Founder, New York Performance Standards Consortium. She'll be discussing the performance assessment system used by schools in the consortium. We'll also hear from Young Wan Choi, Manager of Performance Assessments for the Oakland Unified School District. He'll be talking about the district's efforts to take performance assessments to scale. And Paul Leather, Director for State and Local Partnerships, Center for Innovation and Education. He'll be talking about state-level efforts to advance performance assessments. And finally, Deb Delisle, Executive Director and CEO of ASCD. And she'll be talking about what her organization is learning from practitioners about the value of performance assessments in their work. At the end, we'll have time to respond to questions from the audience. We encourage you to submit your questions through the throughout the presentation in the chat box. And again, make sure to select all participants from the drop-down. Before I turn the webinar over to Anne for her presentation, let me briefly introduce her. Anne is the Executive Director and Co-Founder of the New York Performance Standards Consortium and was also the Co-Founder and Co-Director of the Urban Academy Laboratory High School, a New York City public school. She has taught both high school and college level students in courses such as children's literature, the history of the civil rights movement, and Don't Read That Book, a course on censorship. She is the author of three series of children's books, including the Monster series. I'll now turn the webinar over to Anne. Hi, everyone. Uh, the New York Performance Standards Consortium has developed a proven tra practitioner developed student-focused performance assessment system for its 38 member schools that are in New York City and state. Its validity has been established by the New York State Education Department and the New York Board of Regents starting in 1998 and reaffirmed through variances most recently in 2017. Its main components are it's a practitioner-designed and student-focused assessment tasks. It has external evaluators for written and oral student work moderation studies to establish reliability, extensive professional development, and predictive validity based on graduates' college success. There are other components that include an emphasis on inquiry-based teaching and learning and discussion-based classrooms. So the consortium schools have taken this and developed a culture that's focused on deeper learning skills. They're freed from the pressures to teach to the test so that the consortium teachers are able to develop a multi-layered student-focused curriculum in addition to and beyond the assessment tasks. The tasks that are up there include English, an analytic literary essay, a social studies research paper, an original science experiment, and an application of higher level mathematics. Those are required of all the schools in the consortium 
And then individual schools will add on additional tasks, creative arts, art criticism, internships, foreign language, so that schools will have those in addition, but everyone uses the four that are up there as the required tasks. The tasks can, are there multiple ways for students to express learning? and exhibit their learning, their writing, their literary essays. They can use research papers, literary essays. There's oral presentations. All of the components, all of the tasks have oral components. There's discussions, debate, poetry reading, dramatic presentations. And also in the creative arts area, of course, in the performing arts, it would be artistic renderings, uh, perf performance, sculpture, painting, photography, and so on. So those are the kind of bare bones, and people always want to know what it looks like. And what we would like to do is show you a clip of a film of one student. The work grows out of classroom work. Uh, they will, students will have had uh, a number of hands-on science classes. And what you'll see in this film is one student's journey through preparing over a course of time the work that he then presented for his final performance assessment. At the very end of the clip, you'll see the, the oral defense. So he's going to take you through the process that he experienced as he was developing his science performance-based assessment task. The experiment I presented today was how does pitch affect loudness? Uh, I was studying how different subjects perceive the different levels of pitch. I got this idea from my sound physics class, and we were kind of going around um, talking about instruments and the physics of the sound from the instruments. And I was messing with the guitar, and I remember that started to make me think of pitch. And so I think he, he came in with interesting questions, and in the sound physics class where he started developing the project he you know he picked out a good question fairly early on and then uh, could work on devising the experiment to carry that out so my experiment is that i am testing out sound okay and i'm going to ask you i'm going to play two notes for you all right and okay. i'm going to ask you which <laughs> note you think is louder okay and your only options are the first note was louder or the second note he read in a book that we looked at in the class that higher pitched sounds tend to be perceived as louder by people and he wanted to, to test whether that was actually the case. So he recorded several sounds from an electronic keyboard at different pitches. I would play a higher note for them and then a lower note and see which one they thought was louder purely based on the pitch of the note. Which one? Second one. Second one? Yeah. The courage that I got in previous classes, I always felt like I was more welcome to kind of come up with whatever idea I wanted and to take that seriously and to turn that into a scientific question. And I mean, that's really where my idea came from. You know, I didn't, it was a, there was no question that couldn't be tested almost. And I knew that from the previous classes that I have done. And like with like hip hop, I guess specifically I hear it in like the the constant. The teachers always allowed us to you know no matter what to answer on. whatever question we wanted, answer it in our own way, um, try to answer it in whatever way we wanted. So that kind of made me way more confident going into this experiment. It is their experiment. It's their work. It's their question, and it's not ours. And. Um, you don't get that same sense of being part of a community, that sense of being a scientist, if you're doing somebody else's question. It's for a, a survival instinct. And so that made me think of all the times that I feel like, I just felt like people are more attracted to high pitch sounds than low pitch sounds. Um, particularly, you know, when I think of like the sirens, sirens are very high pitch as opposed to low pitch. Car screeches are high pitch and people turn when they hear them. And so I just combined with, you know, his, what he said and my real life knowledge, that kind of made me happy. So I think some of the things he learned along the way were 
the importance of doing um, preliminary work can really help you learn things you can't anticipate. I've probably been working on this whole um, project for maybe a year. I never thought I'd be able to type something that long, but as I worked on it and had more ideas to put in it, it just kind of kept on getting a lot longer and longer. And a lot of that did have to do with the fact that I was just gaining more knowledge over the past year. And kind of, I feel like I'm really able to talk about what I've learned. We finished collecting the data and finished writing the paper and prepared for his defense. There's a the rubric that's used to look at the work, both the written work and the oral work is on the screen now. You can access all of this, the, film, the full film, and all of the rubrics are on the website. If you go to the website at www.performanceassessment.org, you'll see the rubrics across the different disciplines, and you'll also be able to access the film. And there are a lot of examples of student work uh, across the disciplines. So it, it, you'll get a better picture of what it really involves to do the performance assessment. I would say this is a system. It's not in one subject. It's used for graduation. The students have to pass all four of the required tasks as well as the ones that the schools add on uh, in order to be awarded a Regents Diploma by the state of New York. So uh, they go on to college. Uh, we have a trial program with a pilot program with CUNY. These kids are doing very well. Uh, we've been doing this since 1998, and we've had a lot of success with students when they go on to college. They all come back and talk about the fact that they really know how to write. They've had so much practice. They know how to speak in class. Uh, they have a lot of the problems that freshmen have coming out of our schools uh, doesn't seem to affect these kids. They have a lot of, uh, of academic skills as well as ability to know how to ask for help and know where to go to get help and know how to use it. So I think that what we've got is a system that has given them a real support and a real way of approaching lear learning. Uh, and we've gotten had successes across the student body. If you at the end we can look at the, some of the at the end of this webinar we can look at some of the results. Thank you. For your presentation. Um, and just a reminder that in the chat box, we did include a link to the resources and to the video uh, from the New York Performance Standards Consortium. Also, just a reminder that if you want to ask any questions or engage in discussion, please do use that chat, chat box and select all participants from the drop-down. Now I'd like to introduce our next speaker. Young Wan Choi is the Performance Assessment Manager for the uh, Oakland Unified School District. Young Wan has been a public school teacher in New York City, Providence, Rhode Island, and Oakland, California, during which time he has developed expertise in project-based learning, curriculum design, and school-based internships. As the manager of performance assessments, he leads the Ethnic Studies Program and supports schools to provide high-quality instruction through a performance assessment system aligned to a rigorous and meaningful capstone project. And I'm going to turn it over to you, Young Wan. Okay, it's great to be here, and uh, I just wanted to say that 20 years ago, I was a first-year teacher uh, in that same building uh, that we were watching the video of uh, upstairs from Urban Academy at a small school called Vanguard High School, which was also part of the consortium, uh, and so, so much of my teaching has been influenced by the work that Ann and others have done, and um, it's exciting to be able to be in a position now in the district here in Oakland where I'm supporting the growth of performance assessment systems um, from a district perspective as well as um, at, at our school sites. Um, so I want to take you back to Oakland uh, maybe five or six years ago um, where we had a graduation requirement that was a senior project and it was articulated in the board policy in very vague terms. It was uh, a student had to create a uh, oral presentation or do a research paper that was a demonstration of key standards. Um, and with that, schools were left to go off and design these senior projects. And uh, what we ended up with was uh, something that one uh, could 
um, describe uh, through these two pictures in the slide. Um, uh, these are two different Lego projects, clearly, um, but they are also very, very different in terms of their complexity, in terms of the rigor, uh, the critical thinking, uh, and the demand, the cognitive uh, demands that would go into uh, creating these Lego projects. And so this was very representative uh, of what was happening in Oakland at that time, which was um, there were, in fact, things called senior projects, uh, but what you looked at across school sites uh, would vary greatly in terms of their complexity and quality. And uh, the teachers and students at the time really uh, were, you know, not, not happy about this. This was not fair for, for students to be held to different standards, and they raised this as a, as a real concern, um, which um, then led us to uh, decide that, you know, we need to convene some teachers and think about uh, what we should do next. Um, and so I just want to point out here that our approach, I think, was really um, uh, one of the key things about our approach that was different was that um, I think a district um, as a bureaucracy often has a response to problems to try to um, manage those problems centrally. Um, and so one way that we could have responded to this situation was to build Lego tract housing um, and essentially require every school to do exactly the same thing. Uh, but instead of that, we said, okay, well, let's bring the teachers together and let's listen to them and help them and support them um, to adjust this problem. Um, so what that led us to do um, was to engage in a process with the teachers where we looked at our graduate profile, um, which you can now see, uh, and it has six different attributes. Um, and this was, you know, in some ways uh, too overwhelming. So uh, the teachers said, okay, well, where can we focus? And they decided to, to focus on three different areas. One was academic proficiency, uh, another was civic engagement, and then the third area that they wanted to focus on was essential communication. And they said, okay, well, can we design a project that aligns to these three outcomes? Um, and even these are really, really big. So they just, they, they said, well, what's a slice within each of these that we can, you know, effectively um, support students through? And so we landed on a research paper to be aligned to the academic proficiency. Uh, we landed on a field research experience where students have to do an interview or survey or focus group in their community, and that's their civic engagement, and then doing an oral presentation in front of a public audience, um, and that's their, their way of demonstrating essential communication. Um, and again, rather than trying to create exactly the same project everywhere, uh, we decided that instead one way that we could approach this was to um, focus on um, standards of quality. Uh, and so our, our work really became about um, identifying and adopting rubrics that school sites could agree on that would be measures of quality for research writing, for field research, um, and for oral presentation. So fast forward six years, it's uh, 2018, and uh, where are we now? Uh, we started off in that first pilot year with um, four high schools and six pathways within the high school. So the pathways are um, smaller uh, learning communities within the school. And so six of those pathways piloted. And um, now if you look at the schools using rubrics, we're at nine high schools uh, and they, they represent 24 pathways within our district. And then there's six schools that are um, not using those rubrics. Uh, and then the number next to each of the schools uh, represent the, the current senior enrollment at each of those uh, school sites. So when we tally all the numbers, uh, we're looking at uh, 1,440 seniors who are going to be assessed using these common rubrics and 643 seniors who won't be, and that's 69% of our uh, graduating seniors uh, from the class of 2018. Um, and so we're talking about roughly 7 out of 10 uh, of our seniors who are you, uh, being assessed by a set of common rubrics that were designed by teachers, that were adopted by teachers, uh, and that this process really was led with teachers at the center, um, and that it was really a grassroots campaign that allowed for the spread of this work. Um, and, you know, when we think about uh, central mandates, you know, to get even 70% of people to do something when the district says everybody has to do this, um, that's a pretty a uh, hard thing to, to see happen. And uh, we were able to get to this number without uh, a mandate and without um, any of the kind of, um, sort of ill will that sometimes comes from central office uh, decisions. 
Uh, and now we feel like we're at a place where we can adopt uh, a graduation policy. And since we already have so much investment on the ground level, that um, it will help us tip the last 30% of our schools um, towards participating. Uh, and so we're excited this year to, to be working towards a board policy where we'll be including the use of these graduate capstone rubrics as part of the expectation. Um, the final point I'd like to make is uh, that while we did focus a lot on uh, developing the rubrics, that, that was not, never the end goal. Um, that the point of the rubrics was for teachers to have common language, to be able to discuss student work, to engage in cycles of inquiry, uh, and to be together in a professional learning community. And that all three of those components, the common rubrics, the, the cycle of inquiry, the, our process, and the professional learning community, uh, were all aimed at transforming instruction. Uh, and that ultimately, the end goal of a performance assessment system isn't about uh, creating yet another uh, perfect standardization of what it is that we expect students to do, but it's really about giving us an opportunity to push uh, for instructional change that's gonna be really meaningful and relevant for students. Great, thank you, Young Wan, for your presentation. If anybody has questions or wants to engage in discussion, I encourage you to use the chat box on the right of your screen and remember to select all participants from the drop down. Now I'd like to introduce our next presenter, Paul Leather. He's the Director of State and Local Partnerships at the Center for Innovation and Education. Paul's background and experience in education, counseling, and administration in New Hampshire spans four decades. He served as the Deputy Commissioner of the Department of Education in New Hampshire for eight years, and for 18 years served as the Department's Director of the Division of Career Technology and Adult Learning. In 1997, as part of the New Hampshire School to Career efforts, Mr. Leather began the journey to create a state model for a competency-based student transcript. This effort resulted in the development and implementation of the New Hampshire competency-based assessment system, and ultimately to the student mastery model now in place as part of New Hampshire's school approval standards. More recently, he has led the development of a first in the nation, next generation educational accountability model called Performance Assessment of Competency Education, or PACE, approved as a pilot pro program with four New Hampshire districts in March 2015. Go ahead, Paul, and take over. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, in my current work, um, where I now at the uh, Center for Innovation and Education at the University of Kentucky with Gene Wilhoyd and Linda Pittenger and others, um, uh, one thing that's become really clear Advancing performance assessment at the state level is a little more complicated than I thought after working on it in New Hampshire for several decades. So to help work through some of the complexity, I thought I would address uh, three things before I get down to business discussing where some of our states are nationally. Um, and so I, I wanted to show this first slide, which is a summary of key performance assessment formats as uh, where we talk about performance assessment formats. Uh, this is taken from a paper by Scott Marion and Kate Buckley. We see several kinds of formats. The first where there are discrete performance tasks often developed by teachers and where they are more or less embedded in instruction and in courses. Uh, the performance-based assessment task model used by the New York Performance Assessment Consortium that Anne described and then showed in her video is an excellent example of this. And uh, the Performance Assessment of Competency Education, or PACE, in New Hampshire also uses this, a very similar model. And they're characterized by being embedded uh, in curriculum and in instruction in most cases. And that the, the curriculum and in instruction is really driven by the guiding questions found in the tasks, as Young Wan talked about. A science experiment where the student actually designs, conducts, and reports on the findings is a good example of this kind of extended performance assessment. Often performance tasks are, are connected to exhibitions as Anne's video showed. And uh, portfolios and exhibitions are also often found together where students are rolling up products and demonstrations of learning over time to demonstrate knowledge and mastery as well as growth of learning. And the student describes the learning in an exhibition. Envision schools in California is often recognized as a national model for these kinds of performance assessments, 
where they are woven together and we hear the Envision folks talk about portfolio defense, where a student stands and delivers around their learning based on their portfolio of work, often used for summative purposes for a student as they move on, including uh, student graduation from high school. Schools and systems involved in profile or portrait of a graduate often use this model. These are, there are some examples, of course, a capstone project in Fairfax County, Virginia, may look different from a portfolio defense at an Envision High School, but the models are similar. I wanted to point this out, though, that there are these different models because often when we talk about performance assessment, we talk about it as if they're all the same, even though they are uh, often quite different from one place to another. Another dimension worth noting is how schools that use performance assessments are organized. This is often defined at the state level, either through leadership by the SEA or through legislation. We've seen roughly three levels of organizations, some emerging from the field through networks of like-minded leaders, as we see in Maine, Michigan, and with charter organizations like Summit, Envision, and others, and of course, the, the seminal work by Ann Cook and folks in New York City. This first level is often referred to as the innovation network, whether it is set up by the state private foundations or like-minded educators are all three. And it's characterized as putting in place systems of performance assessment for the purpose of advancing teaching and learning. Well-known examples where you see this established in state statute are Kentucky and Illinois, as well as a number of other states across the country. Uh, CPAC in California, the California Performance Assessment Consortium, is widely recognized as a network of schools in large and small districts across the state affecting thousands of students. The next level, if you will, is what I am calling pilot networks. Really, the only difference between an innovation network and a pilot network is that the pilot network has been set up through policy as a precursor to going statewide. The current competition in Section 1204 in the Every Student Succeeds Act was taken from the New Hampshire PACE pilot the intent here is to, over time, put such a system in place statewide if, and that is a big if, the system proves itself to be value-added, sustainable, and scalable. Lastly, there is the full-scale uh, implementation. States like Virginia and Colorado, by having state policy that either allows for or encourages the use of performance assessment statewide with a new system, are modern-day examples of this model. Many policymakers worry about going right to uh, full-scale uh, implementation statewide, as the state's ability to do it well is really defined by how prepared educators and school leaders are in putting it into place, both in terms of will, skill, and capacity. Early efforts in the 80s and 90s encountered many problems due to these issues, and educators have long memories, even though many of the technical concerns have been addressed since that time. The third idea that I just wanted to quickly touch on is the idea of a system of assessments, in this case a comprehensive system of assessments aimed at supporting not just local formative and summative student-level work, but also state-level accountability. One of the best-known models of such a comprehensive system is referred to as the 51st state model after a paper by Linda Darling-Hammond, Jean Wilhoyt, and Linda Pittenger in uh, 2014, where local assessments are conceptualized as a part of a larger system of state assessments and grade spans and other quality assurance methods all rolled into one system. The New Hampshire PACE system was designed after this particular model, and some states that are thinking of using performance assessment as a part of accountability are looking at this kind of an approach. Now that I have the dimensions put out there for your consideration, I wanted to share with you some observations of four states. This slide was actually prepared by two grant managers at the Hewlett Foundation, Dennis Udall and Chris Shearer, that formed the analysis that led to my current project, the Four State Performance Assessment Network. What you see here is a summary of some of the key drivers, partners, and potential opportunities in the four states of California, Colorado, New Hampshire, and Virginia. Each state's system evolved from very different places, modeling graduation portfolios to replace the California state assessment, for example, versus a menu of assessment options in Colorado. There are similarities, however, of course, as, as well. So each state has been 
uh, looking at performance assessments as alternatives to the now traditional standards-based top-down large-scale state assessment model largely dominating the country. Each state, by moving to performance assessment, is looking to close the gap between curriculum agnostic state-level assessments and the rich information gleaned through curriculum embedded assessments in classrooms locally. In all four cases, the states and local partners are very interested not just in going deeper, but also broadening the array of understanding about student learning from purely academic knowledge to better understanding student skills and using their knowledge to solve complex, often authentic problems. Dennis and Chris also really saw the development of the engagement and performance assessment in terms of the need to build systems, systems that have much utility and support in the classroom and in the school as at the state agency and the state house. They saw rightly that to put such a system in place requires the involvement and development of teacher and leader capacity in the field, as well as tech solutions and validity, reliability, and in some instances, comparability studies up and down the system. They saw these systems as evolutionary as much as they are transformational. At the Center for Innovation and Education at the University of Kentucky, we see this as a spiral of inquiry, if you will, not as a closed loop, one where educators at both the state and local levels are involved in a culture of learning and complex tra transformative change, where they are examining the conditions necessary to create that change, where they are identifying the key dimensions, entry points, and steps and processes necessary to accomplish change, as well as the critical policy and practices that need to be in place. We believe that it will only be when student learning and growth and greater educator capacity become the central and essential goals overall that we will see the system actually change to support performance assessment, assessments and other ways see, um, to see teaching and learning and thus finally serve the need of preparing our students for the futures facing them in coming years. Lastly, I'd just like to share uh, this last thought. I would be remiss with our next speaker if I did not mention that it took New Hampshire three years of teacher preparation, design, and development to come to a place of being able to transform our system. And that was with the redoubtable Deb Delisle serving as Assistant Secretary of Education at the U.S. Department of Education. Even with her encouragement, understanding, support, and leadership, it took us three years to construct a system like I have described. As our folks in New Hampshire like to refer to it, it may be hard work. It may be the hardest work we ever have done in this field, but it is also the right work, and we would not have it any other way. I think I'll stop there, Renita, and hand it over to you in depth. Great. Thank you so much, Paul, for your presentation. If folks have questions for any of our presenters, please do type them into the chat box and select all participants. Uh, we do have time at the end for a question and answer. Now I'd like to introduce our other and final distinguished panelist, Deb Delisle. She's the Executive Director and CEO of ASCD. Her 40-year career in education, over her 40-year career in education, she has served as a teacher, gifted education specialist, curriculum director, elementary school principal, district associate superintendent, superintendent, state superintendent, and university instructor. She served as the U.S. Assistant Secretary of Elementary and Secondary Education from 2012 to 2015. As the Assistant Secretary of Education, she played a pivotal role in policy and management issues affecting pre-K, elementary, and secondary education for the U.S. Department of Education. Prior to this role, she was a senior fellow at the International Center for Leadership in Education with a deep interest in educator performance systems and creating transformative cultures in schools and districts to support educators, students, and their families. From 2008 to 2011, Deb served as Ohio's 35th State Superintendent of Public Instruction, and prior to that, she was the superintendent of the Cleveland Heights University Heights City School District. I'll now turn the webinar over to Deb. Thank you so much, um, and I'm going to apologize to everybody for my voice. I'm suffering from uh, what everybody else has dreaded across the country. I'm waiting for spring to come. Um, thank you so much. It's really an honor for me to be the uh, uh, closer here before we get into a conversation. Um, and I want to thank everyone for their really good thoughts. And I'm hoping that folks on the webinar 
as understanding of the complexity of this work, but um, as Paul described recently, it is the best work and it's the right work to do for kids. Um, I also want to thank Paul and acknowledge his work because much of what I believe um, and what we're striving for at ASCD lies in the work that we did together in New Hampshire. Um, but I think his, what should not go unnoticed is that three-year time span he talked about. Um, so if, in essence, if, if there weren't enough people at the U.S. Department of Education ready to embrace it and it took three years to get that done, you can imagine how complex it is in local school districts as well as in, across the state. So I don't want to underscore that, but I also don't want to steer people away from trying it just because it's hard, because it is the right work to do. Um, so what I really want to talk about is on a broader spectrum, kind of lifting up all of the conversation that was mentioned earlier in the, uh, the exemplary um, work that's being done at the local level with the great um, uh, information that was shared. Um, so you see the mission of ASCD on here. Um, and in essence, performance tasks really speak to the how of our whole child framework. We have been in existence for 75 years. Our primary purpose is and goal is to enhance the craft of educators, um, no matter their role in the system. So we're um, the only membership organization that actually has a place for everyone from student teaching um, up through retirement. Um, we've been at it for 75 years. Um, but our whole child framework has been in existence for the past uh, 10. And you can see what the primary goal is at the end of that mission statement, so that every child is healthy, safe, engaged, supported, and challenged. Um, at ASCD, because of this whole child framework, we have a keen interest across the world in engaging um, all of our students in relevant and meaningful learning activities because we firmly believe that performance tasks speak directly to the social and emotional safety of students as well as the support of their aspirations, and they become challenged and they're able to compete not just with themselves, but with others as they see student work being shared through networks and other examples. Uh, you can see here the depth of our membership, and I highlight this because we have members across 127 countries that are close to 115,000 members, and we have 56 affiliates. I share this to show you both on the left side the cross-section of individuals we have who are um, members of our organization. And what's very interesting to me, I came to ASDD two and a half years ago, is that I have not found anyone who has a difference of opinion across typologies of school districts um, or states or other countries. Um, and while we have affiliates in countries as different as China and Ghana, their commonality across all of those and across our states is that everybody wants to do what's right for their students. And so most of our members are striving to figure out how do you do that in an environment, particularly in the United States, which seems to have a very great love attraction um, with summative assessment. Excuse me. So this is uh, cut down to say that equity matters. It's one of our areas of focus and a prime driver of our work. What you can see here Excuse me, I'll take a drink of water. What you can see here on performance assessments is this is our work. This is actually why we are focused on performance and, and support performance assessments. Um, ASCD has long prioritized multi factor assessments. <coughs> our authors and researchers had readily share their importance, and members recognize it performance uh, assessments impact on learning. We have a desire to make learning and teaching relevant, not just, <coughs> I'm so sorry, not just to the um, lives that kids lead and teachers lead in the classroom, but also those that they lead, lead outside of the classroom. We have a belief that what we offer to our students tells them what it is that we value. We recognize that personalized learning can be achieved through performance tasks and assessments. And most importantly, we recognize that the time is now. We have to get past this over-reliance on one type of assessment. And if we don't do it, meaning we inclusive in education, who will do it? <laughs> what you'll see on this slide is that these are the lifting up I've done 
um, both through focus groups as well as the comments we hear in our conferences, what our researchers are telling us. And if you scan down that list, what I want to reassure you is that these concerns are surfaced across all ty kinds of typologies, across socioeconomic um, groupings of students and, and uh, schools, cultural and specific groups. And this is what we try to push really hard through our professional learning, is that um, schools and districts, educators, want a common research-based definition of performance assessment. Perhaps it'll differ in some semantics from district to district, but in each school, people are looking for district leaders to come together and form a definition so that they can remain true to it and have fidelity to it. There's a recognition that collaboration is required to develop and implement performance assessments. They want to know how to communicate this with parents and students. This is especially true if districts and schools are willing to have students progress at various levels of achievement where competency is attained, rather than being held to a large cohort of kids enrolled in a class or in a grade level to all move together. There's a recognition that this serves our, our most vulnerable students, our challenged students, as well as our students who are gifted. They don't want to be bound by one entire group of students in a class level of achievement. But how do you explain that to parents? How do you explain it to kids? Because so often parents will come in and say, is that an A? Is that a B, right? There's a need for time, what it would look like to be coached in effective implementation and use. <coughs> and how do you align with the philosophy of teaching and learning with standards in the school? What are developmentally appropriate tasks and assessments? Most often we hear from uh, teachers, they don't want a watering down. They want to lift up standards for kids and provide support with high goals for all kids and with the support needed to reach those goals. And the most especially, how do you have fidelity across a school or a district so that a teacher in one grade six is not different than a teacher in another grade, meaning they have different standards for kids. And that's one thing that Paul and his team in New Hampshire really did a wonderful job at. So all in all, our educators, our members, just want one thing. They want us to be able to help them to be better at their craft because they totally believe that they need to be the best that they can be for their kids. So it's really all about professional learning and allowing educators the time and space to deal with performance assessments, both in terms of an understanding as well as a, a policy and a procedure to get to performance assessments to be adopted within the system. So I'll end there, and I really apologize for my voice. Great, thank you so much, Deb. Now I'd like to begin our discussion and address some of the questions we've received from the audience. And the first question is actually directed to Ann Cook. And Ann, the question is whether you could speak to the demographics of the students who attend schools in the New York Standards Performance Standards Consortium. And I'd, I'd love for you to talk about that as well as um, how you're um, ensuring that all students have access, especially uh, those who are furthest from opportunity. So we address the equity question, and then maybe also talk about um, the evidence of impact that you all have uh, collected over the years. And you might be muted. Yeah, this, uh, uh, someone has chart one. Yeah, so this is a comparison of consortium schools which we are all uh, public schools, not charters in the city. We're all public schools. Some of them are 6 to 12, some of them 9 to 12. Uh, then th this shows a comparison of the consortium with the New York City Public High School. Data, that's a data derived from the city school system. So you can see that um, we have um, – uh, who's in the schools? You can see that we have um, – uh, equal numbers of kids of po in poverty. We have um, more L kids. 
than uh, in the consortium than the percentage. Uh, if you work out the figures that in the high schools, if you go down and you look at the average eighth grade proficiency, you'll see that our kids enter eighth grade, ninth grade, based on the eighth grade. Uh, statewide exams, they're performing at a lower level than the city average. But then if you look at the four-year graduation rate, the six-year graduation rate, and you go down that column there of uh, African American students, Hispanic students, L students, uh, the consortium students are outperforming the city uh, similar population kids um, on almost every category. I don't know. If, um, this, uh, I think it's Gretchen Wright who asked that question. So this is a, really addresses the issue of who's in our schools. Uh, so the students in New York City um, uh, uh, come into high schools in a very uh, kind of <laughs> very complicated way. Most of these kids are coming in. A lot of them are neighborhood schools still. Uh, there are some degrees of choice also. Uh, where kids will rank order their selections, but uh, it's a, it, what we have in these schools among our 38 schools, we have five that are L uh, focused. With the, the, the kids in those schools have failed the NISASLAT, which is the English proficiency test, and they have had to be in the country four years or less in order to get into those schools. Uh, but you look at the L figures, and you'll see uh, that they're. Um, the, the L graduation rate is uh, almost 30 points higher for the kids for those kids in the consortium than they would be in the city as a whole. Uh, we have um, six transfer schools. The kids are coming from other schools, either uh, they, they were overage and undercredited, or uh, they were homeless, or they, there are a number of categories that kids tend to leave the school they were assigned to originally. Um, and end up in a transfer school. We have six schools that are transfer schools that are, are in the consortium. So we have a very, we have a high percentage. Some of our schools have 30% of our kids are, are special ed kids. Um, uh, uh, so we we have, I think, it's clear from this chart, uh, a very uh, representative group, in fact, probably more challenged than the city as a whole. But the results, it, if you look at the graduation rates, if you look at the dropout rates and so on, the results are are much better than the city average. Great. Thank you, Ann. Uh, we have another question about the cost of performance-based assessment. And the question is, is performance-based assessment feasible from a cost standpoint, and how is that addressed? And I'm wondering, Paul, if maybe you could kick us off um, by responding to that question. Sure. I, I think in my comment, I did say that some some of the technical uh, barriers had been addressed. Cost, of course, is uh, goes beyond that. It's a kind of a systemic uh, issue all around. Um, but some of it has been solved through through technology, of course. I think as we start to see uh, platforms uh, where um, uh, performance tasks can be constructed asynchronously, uh, where where uh, calibration of student scoring can be done asynchronously, also on platforms. Uh, then uh, we start to see some of the the big costs of performance uh, based assessment go down, uh, particularly from a system standpoint. Uh, just by way of example, for New Hampshire, our accountability system, we really didn't have a lot of money to be running. Uh, a second system of accountability as we constructed PACE uh, uh, using the, uh, while the, the, the large-scale state assessment system continued to go on. And so um, we, we, our accountability model um, cost approximately uh, $300,000 for the last four years consistently as we went from four schools to 28 schools. Now, um, the, the, where the cost can can grow is, is as you build deeper and uh, more significant professional development and, and looking at ways in which you build tasks together, where you score tasks together and use that as your professional development, you can get uh, economies of scale across districts and, and with large groups of educators. And that's what New Hampshire has done and that's what a lot of states that we're seeing, uh, whether they're doing innovation zones, pilots, or 
full-scale uh, uh, engagement, as I talked about, uh, are doing it. So um, the costs are, are differential depending on your model, but um, I think there are ways to solve cost issues if you go about it in a smart way. Can, can I just to add to that in terms of the consortium? The consortium uh, schools don't cost the system any more than the regular schools. In fact, there have been times when the when the consortium schools have actually been funded at a less uh, at a less rate. Uh, we had interim assessments that where the state the city was purchasing uh, interim assessments from major commercial testing companies to prepare the kids for the regents exams those those costs worked out to somewhere around 14,000 per school and when we went to them and said went to the department and said we're not giving those exams but we want to use inter we want to develop a system of interim assessments they funded us at about 5,000 per school we did we did the work with that so we were being funded at a less less of, a, of an amount, I think if they were to increase this across the state, the thing that Paul is mentioning about the professional development is really the key. And if you're talking about scaling up anything, that's what needs to be scaled up. The workshops, the kinds of curriculum planning sessions, the sessions we do moderation studies where we regrade blind all of the papers that are sent in by schools, that is a very valuable aspect of professional development that's generated from the bottom up, not from the top down. So I think a lot of it has to do with rethinking how we go about thinking about some of these uh, costs. We're certainly a lot cheaper than the tests. Uh, this is Deb Delisle. I just wanted to add and build on what Ian said and, of course, what Paul said, because the reality is, is that it's reprioritizing resources, but also what value people have. So one of the things we've had to do at ACD is totally change a mindset that um, professional learning was only about sit and get or, you know, go somebody and hear a speaker. And time and time again, um, uh, pushing 90% of our members always stress the importance of on-site, job-embedded professional learning, and they want to learn from one another. So as Ann was indicating, it's really critical to provide those opportunities. When we've been working with states and districts, one of the things we find is that for some reason districts are more apt to provide substitutes so teachers can get ready to help one another prepare kids for a test. If you utilize that uh, format and that time in a different kind of way, you tell teachers that it's valuable for them to learn one another, from one another in creating the performance tasks themselves. Coming from the U.S. Department of Ed, I can say that not everyone uses all of their federal funds as thoughtfully um, as perhaps could be done. So we help to uncover some ways, whether it's uh, Title I funds or other kinds of, um, of course, Title II is now going away, but there are ways to access federal funds in different kinds of ways when you're supporting the growth of all students. Great. Thank you, Deb. Um, we have another question that came in, and this one's to Anne. The question is, to what do you attribute the dramatically higher English learner and special education graduation rate versus other subgroups? among the New York Consortium schools? That's a very interesting question because we, we, we thought a lot about that. Um, I think that, that, that you have to start by, by thinking about what is it that, that is happening here. What, what I think is going on when you have uh, a, a performance-based assessment system that really is uh, changing, it's not being driven by the tests. The curriculum and the instruction are driving the assessment. So if, so if you're freed up from, from teaching to the test, you're developing the kinds of courses that are engaging students at a very high level. There tends to be much more inquiry-based teaching and learning. You have a lot more discussion going on. These are much more discussion-based classes. There's very little chalk and talk. And I think that what happens in these classes is that you just get kids using the language in these schools. There is a real commitment because the performance assessment system means that you're developing a culture in the school. Since it's not just a class that's doing this, it's the whole school. It's all the subjects. This is the way kids are assessed. So every class, kids are talking more. They're engaged in writing more. They're, they're listening to teachers talk at them less. And all of that contributes to kids learning the language. That's how they're learning. They're using the language. And I think that has a lot to do 
with the way these kids are responding. I've had them attend conferences with me, kids who've been in the country four years, three and four years. You can't tell. they were. It's really embarrassing when you think our kids have been in, have taken three and four years of language, uh, and they, they can't really speak it. These kids are speaking English uh, extremely well. That is the language of instruction, and they're using that language all day long, every day. So even in schools where there are 45 different language groups, the language that they're being instructed in, that they're talking in is English. There might be another student, maybe, who speaks Punjabi or some other language that they are that, that is their native language, but their instruction in the classroom is in English, and they're immersed in it, and they're using it, and I think that is what's making the difference. Great. Thank you, Anne. So we have about a minute left on this webinar, and I want to thank Anne and Young Wan and Paul and Deb for a great discussion today. I'd like to remind the audience that we are recording this webinar and we'll email you in a few days when it's available. We'd also like to invite you to join us for the next webinar in the series, Leading the Way, How States Are Using Deeper Learning Assessment. Again, this will be on May 17th at 11 a.m. Pacific. And as I mentioned at the beginning, you can register and find more information about that webinar using the link, links pasted in the chat box. This webinar is part of a series, Achieving Equity Through Deeper Learning, and we'll be having additional webinars throughout the year. We'll send in notifications via email if you'd like to sign up for our email list. And finally, we'd like to share the following online resources, which will also be posted on this webinar's page. Again, thank you, and have a good afternoon. <laughs>